Hey everybody. Um, so I'm Max Mecklenburg, one of the PGY1s. And uh, this presentation is about coca ethylene. It's titled, When the Party Just Won't Stop. All right, first I'd like to just thank the Small Talks team, uh, including Drs. Turner, Chu, and Kopchuk, and a special thanks to Dr. Wiener for some of the biochem stuff that you'll see later on in here. All right, so we'll start with the case. Um, we get a 45-year-old male comes in reporting chest pain at around 10 a.m. after partying last night. He says he was up until about 5 a.m., um, slept for a little while, woke up with some chest pain. Uh, so what are some immediate considerations uh, for management or assessment of this patient that you would think of? You can just shout stuff out. Yeah, you want an EKG. We'll get to that on the next slide. Do you want to put this patient on a monitor? Yeah. Would you want some labs? Yes. What's one lab you might want specifically for a patient with chest pain? True, great. Do you want a tox screen on this patient? Yes. Cool. Yeah, this, this might be a patient where a tox screen might be valuable. Um, depending on the history. If they tell you that they were doing, let's say, cocaine and drinking, um, which is what you see in this picture of their party last night, um, you might not need the tax screen specifically. All right. Um, but it could help you with medication decisions down the line. All right. So this is your initial EKG. Good? Bad? Anything people notice? Definitely tacky. Yeah. Anything about the QRS complexes? So this might be one where you'd wanna look at the numbers you get at the top of the screen. These are widened QRS complexes. They're 138 milliseconds in this one. I just happen to know because I saw it. Um, and if you're Kind of looking, um, the QT is, depending on which lead you look in, is prolonged. Um, and this QT is uh, almost 600, QTC, almost 600. Um, all right. And in this particular patient, they got a medication that we'll talk about in just a moment. Um, and this was their next EKG. Less concerning. less concerning. Um, some things you might notice in this EKG are some subtle ST elevations and depressions. Uh, if you look in the anterior leads, like V1 through V3, some slight elevations. These are not meeting uh, STEMI criteria. 2, 3 AVF, you have some slight depressions. Um, and so these are EKG findings that you might see in cocaine toxicity. However, in this patient, they were drinking and then doing cocaine. And when you do those two things together, you can form various metabolites, all right? And so cocaine is metabolized in the liver by carboxylesterase enzymes. I know you see these uh, biochem pictures here. What I want you to notice is the similarity between cocaine and the uh, metabolite cocaethylene, all right? And that is metabolized in the presence of ethanol. Um, so when ethanol is already there, that's going to be created along with a whole bunch of other metabolites, uh, which we can talk, touch on briefly. So more biochemistry. Um, so I know people don't often like these kind of charts just to simplify it. If you look at the x-axis, that's micromoles of cocaine. So it's a concentration of cocaine and the uh, sort of rate constant over minutes. So the higher the rate constant per minute uh, is the quicker that it's going to be metabolized at any given concentration. So if you look at say a concentration of 50 micromoles of cocaine, the cocaine is going to be metabolized the fastest and the metabolite benzoyl ectganine is going to be metabolized the slowest. 
of note, this is the one that we look for on urine assays for cocaine. We're not actually looking for cocaine. It has a much, much longer half-life and it's easier to detect. It's also uh, metabolized both by enzymatic and non-enzymatic. Shout out to Dr. Wiener for explaining this to me. Um, mechanisms, which means that it's not genetically dependent on what your enzymes are like to metabolize it. And so it's another reason we use it to detect um, cocaine use. Now, what I want you to see is that cocaethylene is kind of in between the two, but has a much longer half-life than cocaine itself. All right, it's about two hours versus one hour for cocaine. Um, all right, so next slide. All right, so why does this matter? Cocaine is cardiotoxic. For patients with MI between 18 and 45 years of age, cocaine con contributes to about 25% of those MIs. Um, almost up to 6% of patients presenting to the ED with chest pain after using cocaine will rule in for an MI based on cardio cardiac biomarkers. And the risk of MI increases as much as 24 times during the first hour after cocaine use. Now, a lot of that is likely due to cocaethylene, that metabolite we were just talking about, which is thought to be almost 10 times more toxic, cardiotoxic than cocaine. It's a more potent vasoconstrictor while simultaneously increasing chronotropy and inotropy, which in turn are increasing O2 demand and it acts for longer. Um, now, as far as the EKG findings that we just saw on those last few slides, um, cocaine inhibits the inflow of sodium. Uh, thanks Matt for explaining this during the last presentation, um, during depolarization and can lead to that QRS widening that we just saw, um, as well as QTC prolongation. Um, they've done animal studies finding that cocaethylene specifically, and they use pretty high doses, um, had also cardiodepressive effects uh, at a certain point, which decreased contractility, stroke volume, and mean arterial pressure. So that might be something to look out for in extreme overdose, but we haven't done any human, human uh, studies on that. Um, and of note, Long-term cocaine use will lead to atherosclerosis, which makes all of those short-term effects that we just discussed all the more dangerous, all right? So does it only affect the heart? No, as we know, uh, these drugs also affect our decision-making. And so um, another study, which is by some folks you might recognize, um, studied patients who came into CCT after trauma and actually did get those urine assays looking for cocaethylene specifically, as well as cocaine and ethanol, and checked who had to go to the ICU more frequently and found that patients who had cocaethylene on board um, were independently, when controlling for the other metabolites, more likely to be admitted to the ICU than patients who had either cocaine or ethanol in their systems independently. Of note, that probably means if you just have cocaine but not cocaethylene, um, it might mean that you did cocaine in the days prior um, and so it's not as active. So maybe some of that is due to the cocaine use. 70% um, of these patients had blunt trauma mechanism for their injuries, 47% head trauma, um, and it was, like we said, significantly higher number to the ICU with cocaethylene. So route of ingestion. On our left, we've got former Toronto mayor Rob Ford smoking cocaine base. On our right, we have Tony Montana insufflating cocaine. Which one of these two patients, if they were drinking, both of them are drinking at the time of uh, consumption, which one do you think would have a higher amount of cocaethylene in their systems? Anyone? Okay, so just thinking about uh, rates of metabolism, uh, the answer is Tony Montana, because um, you're taking the cocaine in a little bit more slowly through insufflation than you would through uh, smoking. And so um, a higher, let's see, in a study, um, cocaethylene formation was measured at 34% via smoking uh, versus 18% um, via actually oral consumption, but similar 
similar uh, intake mechanism. Um, so it does matter if you get a chance to ask patients how they were consuming the cocaine that they used. Injection was somewhere in between. So how do we manage these patients? All right. Um, I want to note that cocaethylene, as far as management, is a matter of uh, a difference of quantity, not of kind, in terms of its effects on the body. It's more cardiotoxic. It lasts for longer. The actual treatments are the same. Okay, so your first line that's going to counteract the uh, increased sympathetic effects of the cocaine metabolites, cocaethylene, it's going to be benzodiazepines. Um, diazepam is the go to for a lot of these patients. Um, but as we saw in those dysrhythmias um, in the EKG, they're also going to need sodium. And the form that we give them is sodium bicarb. I saw a bunch of case reports that for cocaethylene toxicity specifically, um, some of these patients actually required sodium bicarb drips. And so that might be something to consider if you have patients who are not getting better with boluses of sodium bicarb. What, is the, what are some medications we want to avoid with cocaethylene or cocaine toxicity? Traditional, yeah, so traditional um, wisdom is that we should avoid beta blockers. There are apparently some new studies suggesting that it's not actually dangerous. It's more of a theoretical risk. Um, but in practice, I think most people still avoid beta blockers in the, in the treatment of cocaine toxicity and cocaethylene toxicity. Um, another drug you want to avoid, uh, if you have these agitated patients, you want to avoid our go-to, which would be Haldol. Haldol can also cause QTC prolongation, and we don't want to contribute to that in these patients. All right. If you do uh, need to control a hypertensive emergency and the benzos are not doing it for you, um, one uh, medication that is discussed, I haven't seen it used in personal practice, is fentolamine, which is an alpha adrenergic blocker and could theoretically help with that sympathetic stimulation without uh, causing the unopposed alpha activity. Um, all right. And also for management, I want to put in a plug for people to put in the consult to catch team. I think a lot of us heard about it at some point and then forget about it. This is the consults for addiction treatment and care in hospitals. It's a HHC program. These are folks who are around like nine to five during the daytime and can actually come and initiate uh, substance, substance disorder treatment in the hospital. And all you have to do is type in consult to catch team. All right. So some takeaways for ED practice, cocaethylene, is probably present in your patient who is drinking and doing cocaine. The reason it's important to be aware of cocaethylene is it has a longer half-life and it's a more potent vasoconstrictor, more potent inotrope, more potent pronotrope. Um, ask your patients about the sequence, the amounts, and the route of ingestion of both the alcohol and the cocaine if you're able to. It matters because if they drank the alcohol after the cocaine, it's less likely to form cocaethylene. If they drank before, more likely amounts, and as we discussed, route of ingestion. Consider the need for drips due to this longer half-life as needed. And here are my references. I'd love to hear any questions or comments. Thanks, Dr. Gonchana. Mentioned, wanted to mention that when you want to hang uh or you might from red. Of course, you're going to give them a bowl of one to two million kilo to make them alkaline, right? The alkaline serum in this case, just like you do with aminophilia, just like you do with LFL. Uh, and rather than the urine, which you can do with salicylase and you know, with phenobar. But you want to give them that bolus. And then, what a, a nice way to do the drip is to take a liter of E5W. And add two to three amps of sodium bicarb. And then you can set the drip, and in this case, you're aiming for a serum pH around 7.5 or so. Thanks, Dr. Grinchaman. So, for the folks online, 
Uh, Dr. Grensheimer is mentioning that we want to put in uh, bolus before any drip of sodium bicarb of one to two MEQs per kg, and that you can mix that in to D5W um, for a target of uh, serum, serum pH of around 7.5. Any other questions? Thanks, Matt. I just wanted to say that, uh, so it's, like it's technically true that the avoidance of beta blockers is okay toxically. It's theoretical in the sense that it's never been proven in lactation outcomes. But it's not theoretical in the sense that it's like, like the, the, the models that they do have it are like they have there's experiments with the dog parts where they, they have shown that giving beta blockers during cocaine intoxication very really causes basal constriction of the coronary arteries, um, which is the evidence that they use to, to disprove it. Interesting. Okay, so Matt is just reminding us that while there are not human studies, there are animal models. Uh, showing that unopposed alpha activity after giving beta blockers and cocaine toxicity does cause vasoconstriction, and that um, it's probably important not to give beta blockers after cocaine toxicity. It's interesting that so many sites now make a note of saying that there's no proof about beta blockers. Yeah, so, I've, I've, seen it, I've seen it too. I, I brought it up once at the New York City Conference. It came down with that. <laughs> Anyone else? All right. Thanks very much.